So that our swirling world of feelings, feeling tone, we get to show up together and know it feels like this being together, right? Every sense, contact, every experience has a feeling associated with it. So what's the feeling that's being known here and now? The feeling of being together, the feeling of the body sitting, the feeling tone of the clothes touching the skin, the feeling tone of the mood. So hopefully in these seven weeks, we've become a really good student of feeling tone. We'll chant the refuges and then we'll have our guided meditation. some time, settle into a stable, relatively still, relaxed, upright posture. And as best we can, let's manifest some confidence, even courageousness as we relax into this swirling ocean of feeling. And we're often using the more concrete experience of bodily sensations and the feeling tone associated with the different physical sensations coming and going. And I'd like to think of this as a willingness to be exposed, buffeted by the different sensations and feelings that come and go. Let's 
It's only when we're willing to be right in the middle, open, sensitive, that we can begin to sense the ephemeral nature of feeling tongue. And in particular tonight, being curious, learning to attune to this whole range of neutral experience. And the tendency of the mind, the habits of the mind is to want to ignore, to be indifferent or apathetic about what's neutral. Like the, a lot of the sensations in the body, like the sensations of the clothes touching the skin might be relatively neutral not standing out as pleasant or unpleasant. So just as a little training, keep in mind the sensations of the clothes against the skin and the neutral feeling tone associated with those sensations. If your eyes are open and they're seeing, being numb, a lot of the visual objects, maybe the great majority of visual objects are neutral, neither obviously pleasant nor unpleasant. So notice that. If we can train the mind to be actually curious with neutrality, we'll learn something about balance and about non-reactivity, non-contention, and then when the mind is provoked by a strongly pleasant or strongly unpleasant experience, we might notice how the balance is lost and the mind falls into a period of reactivity, thinking about how I want to get rid of something or I want to make something last. So finding our way back to balance. And the balance we learn, the non-reactivity we learn by being aware of neutrality. And we can use that to explore that same balance, that same non-reactivity with painful sensation, painful sights, painful thoughts, and the whole pleasant end of the spectrum. We're going to continue in silence for a period of time. And just have that sense of being established right in the middle of this great river of feeling flowing, always flowing on and on.
and we're inspired by this possibility of balance, non-reactivity in terms of healing. Oh, it's unpleasant, okay. Unpleasantness. Oh, it's pleasant, okay. It's just pleasantness. Oh, it's neutral, okay. It's just neutral. And in this way, we're gonna practice attuning to the joy of renunciation. The renunciation of our reactivity to feeling. Of course, this is a more refined happiness, the joy of renunciation. And we'll take this up as our meditation object for the rest of the set. Sitting in a composed way, balanced way, in this great river of feeling tone. Feeling tone coming because of the thoughts, because of the sensations, the sights, the sounds. And we're willing to be open and receptive right in the middle. And we're keeping in mind the joy of letting go, letting go of reactivity.
So we're willing to remember there is this river, flowing river of feeling tone. And the sensitive heart, the knowing mind is naturally exposed. To really see it as a courageous act to soften right here in the middle of this great river, feeling what we're feeling. And we're experimenting with being composed, balanced, kind, non-reactive. And we just let feeling do what feeling does. It moves, changes, And so in a way, the object of meditation is the changing nature of feeling tone, the flow of feeling tone. So we'll continue for another five or so minutes.
One way we can notice feeling tone is when we notice we're lost in thought, some kind of self-centered drama. And then when we ask, well, what's the underlying feeling tone here? We can see how the not being aware of feeling tone with wisdom supports the self-centered drama. If we're feeling some pleasantness, but we don't have wisdom, then we might start planning because life feels good, full of possibilities, because there's an un, uh, there's a pleasant feeling without wisdom. Or if there's a painful feeling that's not being acknowledged, you might notice the mind thinking about other difficult experience or wanting to escape, wanting to get away from. And interestingly, then when there's wisdom knowing this river of feeling, there's much less need for thinking about this and that and mental proliferation. The mind becomes more quiet. So for just another minute or two, with courage, resting, softening, opening, right here in the middle of the flow of feelings coming and going. Everything belongs. So take a moment and stretch out. And yes, yeah, sorry about the noise. I see the thing put in the chat. Uh, <laughs> we're having our roof replaced and they're working late tonight, but I think they're done for the evening. So tonight is week seven of our seven week class studying the Buddhist teachings on mindfulness of feeling tone. And uh, I guess and you probably feel like I do, which is we're just scratching the surface. And this particular study will take us all the way to awakening. And I don't know if you have heard this. I, I love this about the early Buddhist tradition. You know, the awakening 
of the arahats, the other awakened beings. And at the time of the Buddha, there were many. Their awakening is the same as the Buddha. It's not like the Buddha had more awakening. <laughs> the difference is what makes a Buddha a Buddha is somebody who woke up, had the deep insight without help from a teacher. And the other characteristic of a Buddha is they can articulate the awakening process in a way that's helpful for other people. And that's, that's always been inspiring. And, and one of the ways awakening, one of the main ways awakening is described is to be a sensitive being in this river of feeling, right? Because that's what it means to have a mind and body, to have sense contact. We see a sight, we hear a sound, we smell a smell, we taste a taste, we touch a touch, we think a thought. And all of those sense contacts through those six sense gates, there's a feeling there. It feels like this. And that feeling is in most cases, a mental construction, you know, with the exception of touch, where there's something wired in, you know, some touches are just known to be painful or known to be pleasant. But, you know, a disturbing sound is disturbing, not so much because the sound itself is disturbing, but because the mind is conditioned to, to see that as an unpleasant sound, like heavy metal music. You know, some people might find it pleasant. It isn't in the actual sound, it's in the mind's conditioning, the pleasantness or unpleasantness. But the basic uh, path is to develop this continuity, the stability of present moment awareness, to be interested in feeling tone, and there's a nice image from Sharon Salzberg. Some of you probably have heard this is imagining standing on a tightrope, balancing there on the tightrope and, um, and moment by moment, you know, another feeling comes your way. And, uh, you know, eventually we're going to react. We're going to take the movement of feeling personally and uh, fall off the tightrope. But we always end up on a tightrope again. <laughs> so we don't have to worry so much about these moments of reactivity, wanting to hold on to the pleasant, averse to the pain, ignoring all the neutral. The key is just to remember right now we're back on that tightrope. We're right back in the river of feeling it's one way we can frame or understand what it is to be a human being or the sensitivity. And one of the things we can attune to is this flow of feeling tone and to be inspired uh, about this possibility of balance and uh, equanimity with feeling tone. Oh yeah, it's just a feeling. And it really requires seeing the ephemeral nature of feeling tone. The description in one of the suttas is like a bubble, you know, like rain hits the top of a lake and there's a little bubble formed. And it's not much of anything. And like I mentioned briefly in the guided sit, when we, when there's not a lot of wisdom, by definition, what I do, what this mind does with feeling tone is it constructs a self-centered story about the feeling tone. And some of those stories, you know, we won't even recognize like in relationship to a lot of the neutral feelings, things that don't, aren't strongly pleasant or unpleasant enough to evoke the reactions of aversion or greed. Right? The story is, you're not important. And so that's one of the, like I mentioned in the guided sit, one of the ways we can practice, like how can I be in this flow of sensitivity and feeling, you know, this incess incessant sense contact, this bombardment of sensuality.
sights and sounds and thoughts and touches and smells and tastes. And instead of like, you know, thinking, okay, I need to be this fixed edifice to sort of uh, brace myself against the onslaught of sensuality. It's more like the, the strength of that courage that allows us to be a human being is this penetrative wisdom or discernment that knows feelings aren't actually as impactful as I think they are. And we don't start with the most painful feeling or the most pleasant feeling. We start around the edges where the things are slightly unpleasant or slightly pleasant, right? And we practice like being that wise, soft presence. And we just like, let it move, let that somewhat pleasant experience or that somewhat unpleasant experience do what it's gonna do. You know, it's so interesting, like with a pleasant feeling or, you know, there's uh, one thing I reread, a lot of you've heard the story of Ajahn Chah, it's quite famous, This he's a well-known Thai Buddhist monk and meditation master and trained a, num a number of the uh, well-known Western teachers like Jack Kornfield um, and Ajahn Sumedho and many others. But, you know, one of the stories he told a lot evidently and got recorded was just um, being a monk and, and, you know, monks, they back then the Thai forest tradition, they'd wander around, but there'd be certain villages that they'd return to and the people in the village would get to know the monks and the monks of course would stay out in the woods close enough that they could walk to town to get their food, but far enough that they were pretty secluded and they could meditate. And basically they took care of their business in the morning got their food, ate their one meal a day, took care of any other business, so that for the rest of the afternoon, well into the evening, even sometimes all night long, they could practice. And so the story is that, you know, if you've been in Asia, it's still true today to some degree, but they like having their loudspeakers on their buildings, you know, all the, the Buddhist temples and all the other wealthier homes you know, they have their own loudspeaker and they'll play Buddhist chanting and they'll play pop music and they'll play whatever they want to play. And then on top of that, if there's a wedding or some kind of festival, you know, and often it's like in a village, a bigger village, there'll be competing loudspeakers trying to drown out the other one. So anyway, one night, late into the night, Ajahn Chah doing what a, a good monk does, you know, sitting up late meditating and feeling really put upon by all this music, all this noise coming from the village, you know, and thinking to himself, they know I'm here. You know, they pretend to respect me and support me, but here they are, you know, partying and, and these sounds are like attacking me and destroying my meditation. And, you know, because he was a good monk, he got curious about that experience and actually looked well, what's actually going on and he saw that it wasn't that the sounds were attacking his mind it's his mind was attacking the sounds right there was sense contact there was hearing and there was an unpleasant feeling arising because of the sound and because of the story the thinking those the combination of two was experience this unpleasant and then the mind reacts acts out that unpleasantness i'm going to attack now he didn't necessarily get up out of his meditation seat but in his mind he was at war with those terrible villagers who were playing music late into the night even though there was a respected monk just outside of town doing what you know respected monks are supposed to do and how many times is it like this where our mind, because of the pleasantness or unpleasantness of a thought or experience, goes to war to get something that I want, you know, that will make me happy, to hold on to it, to keep someone from taking it away from me. 
or to go, you know, to to go into some kind of self-centered struggle. So this balance, you know, to I think this is really nice. And you know, when we eventually, when we go back out into the world and leave our homes behind, you know, there will be one thing after another that will be experienced as pleasant or unpleasant. And we want to cultivate this sort of attitude of like, I don't want, I mean, I could go through life with blinders on where I don't, you know, don't see or feel or hear or touch anything because I don't know what to do with the feelings that arise when I do have sense experience. That's kind of the tactic of asceticism. Okay. I don't know what to do with all this feeling. So I'm just going to be human, but try to minimize my sense experience. Right? It doesn't really work. I mean, even when we go to a secluded place, we have thoughts about sensuality. And, you know, our system is pretty simplistic. And our, my thought about chocolate pudding is similar to having chocolate pudding. Or my thought about danger is similar to being in danger, right? It's a similar feeling. So even if we got ourselves in a, in a corner or away from everything, our mind would still be generating feeling tone with each thought, each imagining. And so the, the practice the Buddha teaches is start where it's relatively simple, do what you can to be comfortable to be in a pleasant environment. You don't have to go looking for difficulty. There's enough of it around for most of us. So do what you can to have a, to start where it's relatively easy. You don't want to be around the most pleasant because you may not know what to do with that. There's a one scene from the time of the Buddha where uh, a woman, a courtesan had invited the Buddha and all the monastics to provide the meal. And uh, this woman was famous. And back in that culture, uh, these women had quite a, uh, quite a bit of power. Um, and, uh, but he told all the monks, you know, especially the young men, hey, you might not want to look at this person when you walk in, because you may not know what to do with the pleasantness. And that might reverberate in your mind for a long, long time, something like that, right? So when we're developing our confidence and our skill with feeling tone, just start working with ordinary feelings of pleasantness and unpleasantness and eventually neutrality, which is in some ways more challenging until the confidence and the skill builds. And then there will be times Here's an example. Um, some of you know Gregory Kramer, and uh, he's a well-known Dharma teacher. Oh, I know I'm forgetting if he's passed away. I know he had cancer for a long time. Did he pass away? Oh, he's still alive? Yeah. But this is from a while back when his son was diagnosed with cancer. And his son, I think at the time, was 25. And he's just talking about um, how he managed the pain, the very unpleasant experience of knowing his son had advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma and, you know, was going through his chemotherapy and, and all of that. Um, and this is what he wrote, because it's a really good example, like what does somebody who's done a lot of practice, you know, Gregory Kramer is a well-known, he's a, a good Dharma teacher, he's done a lot of practice. So he wrote, this is what he wrote to some of his students. <clears throat> For those who may be wondering, I can offer the good news that a lifetime dedicated to the principles and practices taught by the Buddha truly does prepare one for such things. I have been living at the edge between the searing pain associated with deep caring and the clarity of not proliferating into the second arrow of grasping. Sometimes I'm at the precipice where the mind's imaginings and heart's anticipations want to suck me into fear and grief. But with the support of mindfulness, I, 
I dwell in the intimate moments made possible by non-denial and non-proliferation, not backing away and not grasping. There is the truth of suffering and there is the truth of suffering and there is awareness, the edge that reveals the shared human experience. Sometimes I touch into a moist and fetid anguish, especially when I'm worn out, but awareness bigger than even this suffuses my mind within a few seconds. Following those moments, I know I'm closer to the pain of the world this is the predicament and opportunity we all share. Funny that my biggest lesson from such personal suffering would be a deeper vision of the universality of suffering. The reason I wasn't sure, I know that Gregory has had his own more recent uh, experience with cancer that he's been uh, working with. So this should be, you know, this kind of equanimity, this sort of balance, this kind of capacity, resilience to be with the flow of feeling. I mean, it should inspire us to be able to, not so much to relate to our life as a struggle to get the feelings we want, Right, that's what we'd call a more worldly orientation to life. Like I know what feelings I like and I know what feelings I don't like and I'm gonna use whatever personal power I have to have the feeling pleasantness that I like and avoid the feeling of unpleasantness that I don't like. And a, you know, a spiritual orientation, at least from the Buddhist point of view is the joy, the happiness of renunciation, which is sensing, initially it's just a faint sense of the real spiritual pleasure of not having a problem with feeling tone. So not being dependent or pushed around by the feeling tone, not confused, not spun around by feeling tone. I remember a time when I was practicing as a monk in Burma in Miramar, and uh, there was another monk practicing at the monastery from Bangladesh. And uh, he was a young man and uh, probably in his early twenties even, and kind of good looking young man. And he had left Bangladesh because he had fallen in love or fallen in lust at least with a young woman. And he, he, he was really interested in Buddhism and, and uh, you know, part of the, the thing in Asia, uh, Buddhist monks have a lot of prestige. So it's, it's not only, uh, you know, it's not, people are not only attracted to it for spiritual reasons, but it's sort of like a way to, to sort of power in, in a funny way to be a Buddhist monk. And so this person didn't want to uh, take off his robes and be a lay person. He really wanted to stick with his monastic life. So he went to this monastery in Miramar, you know, Bangladesh is right next to Miramar across the border and uh, was practicing. And at the end of my stay, when I was talking, I didn't really talk much during my stay um, the last few days, I, and he told me, you know, his story and uh, the great tragedy was having done this arduous travel to get to Burma, to get into this monastery and all the paperwork to make that happen. Lo and behold, he sees another young woman who looks like this other woman, right? And it's that like that sight, it's just a visual experience being known. And because of the way the mind's conditioned, it's like, I have to have it. I want, you know, this person to love me or I want to whatever, but there's this not knowing what to do with the pleasant feeling. And <laughs> he went to see the Sayadaw, the main teacher at the monastery, and the Sayadaw told him, 
you're not being mindful, <laughs> which is true, but it didn't help them <laughs> because, you know, it's like, you know, if you, re if you can remember back when you, you know, or I, you know, we fell under the spell of another human being and not just sort of basic attraction, sexual attraction or whatever it is, you know, it's, it's powerful medicine. And, uh, so we want to prepare for those times when there is great loss or great pain, like the story from Gregory Kramer, when he found out his 25 year old son had serious cancer diagnosis, or when something really exciting happens to you, something really beautiful happens. And we can really get spun out in a way that uh, is quite painful. And, and the way the Buddha talks about this is how the joy of renunciation is better than any worldly way, like the, the happiness of not being confused by a feeling is so much better than any feeling we could have from a self-centered point of view, like, oh, uh, getting away from that painful experience or getting that pleasant experience. That's something, right? There is, it feels good when we can, we're in danger and it's painful and then we're out of danger. That feels good. Or we don't have something we want and then we get it. That's pleasant. So the Buddha is not denying, nobody would deny that that's not something. But what he's saying is, check it out. The happiness of not being pushed around by feeling tone is more profound, more trustworthy, more satisfying than anything you're gonna have with a more ordinary or worldly orientation to feeling. So, you know, this distinction between worldly and unworldly feeling, feeling tone is part of the Buddhist teachings. So when we're relating to feeling tone in ways that lead to the predictable outcomes of liking and wanting the pleasant and not liking be, being averse to the unpleasant and ignoring and being indifferent towards neutral. That's the worldly, those feelings we'd call worldly feelings. But it's not the feelings that are worldly, it's the mind that's relating to the feelings, make them ordinary or worldly because they, they're triggering the ordinary response of aversion to pain, traction, greed towards pleasant, and ignoring the neutral. And feeling tones that are unworldly, they don't evoke attachment and reactivity. They evoke the letting go or an independence, a non-dependence. And the question is, do we know that happiness? Do we know the happiness of letting go, not being pushed around? Zenzele writes here, are there instructions when there are sensations that are not quite neutral that may, that may be better described as numbness, which might result when there's too much coming at one at the same time. Oftentimes this happens when one experiences what is commonly called as anxiety. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the, um, because we're constantly experiencing sense contact and that's not gonna change being a human being. I mean, we can simplify our lives if we're fortunate we can simplify to some degree, but even in simple environments, there's a lot of sense contact. And so if the mind, cause you know, some of us, a lot of you have been on retreats where the environment was relatively simple. We didn't have a lot of responsibilities, but it's, a, it's funny how the way our mind works, even in a more simple environment, the mind gets obsessive about smaller things. So there may not be big things happening around us, but all of a sudden the way that person is dressed today 
really bothers us. Or that bird at the bird feeder is so pleasant. And so we can get just as reactive, just as spun around and overwhelmed and anxious and any other kind of reactive pattern. So the, the, uh, the path is like to, I mean, we can simplify our ex outer experience to some degree, but the path is really about that uh, orienting around non-reactivity. And the non-reactivity comes from studying the underlying nature of feeling tone, that it isn't worthy of reactivity. I'll give you an example, like, um, you know, if something is evoking a reaction of anxiety, then instead of feeling like I have to be responsible for every feeling tone, every sense experience, we practice a more exclusive attention to this one thing. And this is really about comprehending, like in order to really comprehend sense experience, sometimes we keep the attention on one thing so we can see it's arising and it's passing. So it's really interesting, like when I, a thought about my future comes into my mind and there's some anxiety, an unpleasant anxiety. And it's nice to just keep like, not pay attention to anything else, but just keep that in mind from this place of wisdom. Like if we're in a defensive stance, like I'm paying attention to make the unpleasant anxiety go away, this won't work. We actually have to be interested. And then we're just letting that theme play out because the mind might rethink about my future. And that waving of anxiety may arise again and that recognition of unpleasantness. And it may happen many times, but over the course of seeing it, what begins to stand out is that the unpleasantness of that story about my future, the thing that I'm anxious about, that that story and the unpleasant feeling isn't really a thing. It's something that arises and passes. But from a superficial point of view, it seems like it's me. And that's what I meant in the guided meditation, how when feeling tone isn't seen clearly, it leads to self-centered thinking and stories. And so then it then the impact on the heart is quite substantial. I mean, it can flatten us. And, uh, and then when we're flattened, when we're overwhelmed by the feeling tone and our reactivity to it, then we don't have any capacity to be aware of other feeling tones at that time. We just want to numb out, like uh, your comment says, Zenzelay. And, you know, there are any number of ways to do it. I just want to watch a stupid TV program, or I just want to have a drink, or I just want to go to sleep. And, and in a way, on one way or another, we do want to reset, we want to refresh, because it's, we're not really going to learn too much when we're in that defensive stance. So how can I, you know, how can I regain my interest. And this is a general point in the Dharma. And it's why, you know, developing our practice to some degree really de depends on good fortune. You know, we not only need access to teachings, but if we're totally overwhelmed with illness, or we're totally overwhelmed by other stressors or being oppressed, being taken advantage of, poverty, racism, or whatever it might be, it's not so easy to practice. And so a lot of times the emphasis is, how can I find more safety in my life? And so when we do have relatively good fortune and relative stability and comfort, that's the time not to kind of kick back and say, oh, a vacation, but how can I practice now so when these conditions change and I'm the one with cancer 
or I'm the one experiencing loss or financial insecurity or abuse of some kind, mistreatment, that I have the resources to be with really unpleasant experience. And it's, it's uh, you know, the more we develop this capacity to be, as the Buddha describes in one of the suttas, unmoved by feeling tone, independent, it really is a superpower to, to live our life. And it's not the same as not caring. It just means like we're, we're actually sensitive. We know what we're feeling. It's not like we're not feeling. But there's this powerful understanding that this feeling that's being felt will come and go. And reacting to it is that second arrow. Why would I shoot that second arrow? And the thing about that we learn with more moderate, not intense, pleasant and unpleasant feeling tone and neutrality too. It's like, what is, what is feeling tone without the self-centered orientation? So, you know, when we're really in a good place in a meditation, let's say, and there's a lot of peacefulness. And then as we're sitting, some pain develops in the body, knee pain or back pain, or we start to get cold or we have to urinate or something like that. And it's really interesting how that painful experience, if the mind is really in balance, it can build and build and build. The mind knows that it's painful, but as long as the mind is in balance, it's, it's workable. It's not a personal problem. But as soon as the mind loses that balance, it can swing very quickly to being completely overwhelming. And then when the mind retains or rediscovers that balance, it's workable again. And I'm guessing that some of you have been in this kind of place in meditation, and it's a very interesting place because what it teaches us is that when, when I lose the balance and all of a sudden I have a problem, you know, this is not okay, I've got to move or whatever, that just seems so real and believable and like the whole truth. But then meditative balance returns and all of a sudden the sit and continuing with the sit is totally workable. And then the wisdom knows in that moment that that self-centered drama that said that this was totally not okay, that wasn't true. So it forever changes how the mind relates to self-centered dramas, little by little. And that's, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of us would even say that, like one of the fruits of long-term practice is not that I don't have self-centered dramas, but that when the self-centered dramas arise, there's space around it. A little bit like Gregory Kramer's thing that I read to you. Like he talked about sometimes the anguish got really intense, right? And then he said, but even then, after a while, a few seconds, a greater space of awareness was there too. That understood, oh yeah, there's this dark space I'm inhabiting and it's being known. It's being felt. It's still part of the river of life that never stops. And because it never stops, it's never self in that permanent sense. You know, one of the things we do with physical pain is we think it defines me permanently, but it's just a passing show. The, what the Buddha says about, you know, neutral, and uh, unworldly neutral experience, this equanimity is that it, it's not about the particular object. So when we talk about the joy of renunciation, we're really talking about an evenness that's about the wisdom more than it is about what the mind is even with. 
And that's kind of what I was pointing to in that example of physical pain when we're sitting. But, you know, you can just start noticing the sense of space or spaciousness in your life where there's the mind is even, not reactive. But the not reactivity, not having reactivity, it isn't that everything is the way you want it to be. I, I've noticed this in particular in really challenging times where something, I don't know what to do, it's painful, I care about it, but it's so intense and it's so confusing like that the mind sort of drops the sense of responsibility that I should know what I'm doing. And I'll have sometimes, you know, now having done a lot of practice over the years, this, this kind of equanimity, this balance, this peacefulness, and just doing what needs to be done, but not really, like I, I care about it a lot, but there's just this real clarity, like I as a self am not in charge. I'm just, my responsibility is to show up and do what I can do, but I'm not in charge about how this thing's gonna unfold. And this is how that, that sense of uh, resilience and um, imperturbability begins to develop in our lives. And a lot of times we think, well, that would just make me not care. But it's actually the right way to care, you know, the right way towards compassionate action. Some of you I know have been uh, reading some of Venerable Analio's books, including his book, three, one of three books on the Satipatthana. In the more recent book, he talks about this. I thought I might read from this because he's talking about this refinement of wisdom around feeling tone. So this particular sutta points out that the difference between neutral feelings associated with ignorance and those associated with wisdom is related to whether such feelings transcend their object. In the diluted case, neutral feeling is predominantly the result of the bland features of the object where the lack of effort on the observer results in the absence of pleasant and unpleasant feelings. As if I can't be bothered to really connect with my world of experience. Maybe I'm depressed, maybe I'm exhausted, or like Zinzale's comment, you know, when there's things have been really intense, we just don't have the brightness of heart and mind to be intimate, to connect. So things might be neutral, but it's neutral because of the lack of interest, lack of intimacy. Conversely, so this is Venerable Analio writing, conversely, neutral feeling related to the presence of wisdom transcends the object since it results from detachment or non-attachment and equanimity and not from the pleasant or unpleasant features of the object. According to the same discourse, the establishment of such equanimity is the result of a progressive refinement of feelings, during which at first, during which at first the three types of feelings related to a life of renunciation are used to go beyond their more worldly and sensual counterparts. So whatever feeling is predominant for us, we could indulge in that feeling, personalize it, react to it, or we could practice letting go of that self-centered relationship to the feeling, right? which just means feeling it. And He's saying that that's, a, that's the first step is to have a more um, renounced or released relationship to feeling because we've developed this capacity to feel what we're feeling. Oh, it feels like this now. And just it's like, this is so much of the first part of the spiritual life is 
realizing that with some stability of present moment awareness, we learn how to be intimate with our lives. We're not so afraid of disappointment. We're not so um, strung out by possibilities of pleasantness because we know how to be with it. The full range of human experience. And then he writes on in the next stage, mental joy related to renunciation is used to confront and go beyond the difficulties related to renunciation. So now we're more in the realm of renunciation, both the joy and the grief. Because even though renunciation is in the direction of freedom, we're letting go of the old world. You know, it's like, that's who I am. I'm the reactive guy who wants good stuff and doesn't want the pain. And so this sort of switch from our worldly existence to what we might call more spiritual orientation in terms of sensuality, pleasantness, unpleasantness, there's some real grief. You know, it's like if you're really into cookies, but you've been cultivating like, you know, the pain of wanting cookies, oh, that's just that unpleasantness. And the joy of eating the cookies, oh, that's just that pleasantness. You're, you're practicing this renunciation, this non-dependence on the feeling. So you, you have to grieve because that was sort of, might've been stressful meaning, but that was meaningful in your life to the, be the one who was obsessed with cookies and everything else, <laughs> such as cookies, of course, TV shows, friendships, success, fear of failure. You know, all these, anything that the mind has been identified with. So they, the intensity and the drama as we cultivate a life of renunciation or maybe because, you know, renunciation just triggers us. So maybe we should say cultivating a life of independence, the heart not dependent on feeling tone, then there will be grieving the ending of that life, the transition. So with the, the second stage is the joy of renunciation we keep in mind to help uh, deal with the pain of renunciation, the unpleasantness of it. And that's the second stage. This process of refinement then leads up to the equanimous feelings, transcending even the non-sensual feelings of mental joy. So the joy of renunciation is replaced. This is interesting. The joy of renunciation is replaced with the, um, the equanimity and detachment as a culmination of practice. Right, so the equanimity and this is even true like in the deeper states of concentration when you have a really deep meditation period. You know, earlier when the sit is going well, there might be a lot of joy, the pleasantness of ease. It's really, it can be really beautiful and pleasant. But as the mind continues to deepen, settle, the heart opens to this place that is neither pleasant nor unpleasant because it's transcended the stress of liking pleasantness, even really inner pleasantness like bliss. So the peace is a more refined happiness, the peace of the mind, not orienting around the duality of pain and pleasure. It's like, the mind has turned away from that. And this is, you know, at the end of the refrain from the, the main discourse the Buddha gave on mindfulness, he talks about the um, realizing the mind no longer dependent. And when our mind is independent, it doesn't mean that we can't interact. It just means that 
our interactions, our choices, our engagement in the world isn't being driven by this worldly quest to get away from pain, to have pleasure. And you see it really frees up how the heart can participate and engage. Because in a way, instead of taking our nutriment for our existence from being able to avoid pain and to have pleasure, the sustenance of our life is the, is the sort of peace of non-dependence. That's sort of the enlivening force is the peace of non-dependence. And we can taste this in moments in a sit. Let me read a little bit. Um, I want to cover a few of the questions that got sent in, but let me just read a few passages from the Buddha. This is one discourse. I might have read this the first week of the class. Just as many diverse winds blow back and forth across the sky, easterly winds, westerly winds, northerly winds, southerly winds, dusty winds, dustless winds, sometimes cold, sometimes hot, those that are strong and others mild, winds of many kinds that blow. So in this very body here, various kinds of feelings arise, pleasant ones, painful ones, and those neither painful nor pleasant. But when a practitioner who is ardent does not neglect clear comprehension, then that wise one fully understands feeling, feelings in their entirety. Having fully understood feelings, one is taintless in this very life, standing in Dhamma with the body's breakup, the knowledge master cannot be reckoned. And here's another short passage. Whatever feelings one feels, whether pleasant, unpleasant, or neither painful nor pleasant, one abides contemplating impermanence in those feelings, contemplating fading away, contemplating relinquishment. Contemplating thus, one does not cling to anything in this world. When one does not cling, one is not agitated. When one, not, one is not agitated, one personally attains Nibbana. And I think it's useful for us to keep talking about this awakening process as, as our, um, yeah, just as like, this is what we need to live the life that we're living. And it's, you know, it's useful to remember that the Buddha and many, you know, of our elders throughout the, the tradition, throughout the centuries of folks practicing these teachings and gaining real insight, they, those folks did amazing things, you know? And uh, so it wasn't that they just hid after the awakening. They were willing to sort of uh, do what needed to be done in the world. And one more passage before I read some of the questions that have come in. For a learned person who has fathomed the Dhamma, clearly seeing this world and the next, desirable things don't charm the mind. Undesirable ones bring no resistance. One's acceptance and rejection are scattered, gone to their end, do not exist. Knowing the dustless, sorrowless state one discerns rightly, has gone beyond the coming to the further shore. So here's some questions that people sent in. Uh, just recently, somebody sent in this question about feeling tone during sleep. They wrote, lately I have been waking up with a negative energy and emotion, wondering where it came from and why it was so well established. By being aware of this and trying not to let the darts 
go wild. You remember the second dart is reacting to the different feelings. It eventually passes away. So I thought I'd start with a success story. That sounds great. And it's true, you know, because when, uh, when we're asleep, mindfulness isn't working very well, right? So the mind, like when we dream, it's like being alive, awake rather, right? And uh, maybe this is a dream too, but it's really the same. We have an idea that this is happening, but it, as far as we know, it's as, it's as real as anything is. So the feeling, the pleasantness or unpleasantness that might arise in a dream, it's gonna be evoke the same kind of response. And then if we're fortunate enough to come into some consciousness that there's this strong feeling, well, yeah, it's gonna have a head of steam because we didn't catch the feeling tone early on. And so the feeling, the push of the feeling tone probably led to the liking or the not liking and patterns of reactivity. And then this person describes being aware of this and trying not to let the darts go wild, right? Feeling the push, but realizing I can just feel the push into reactivity, into getting tight, and eventually it fades away. And it's like one of those things we just need to see thousands and thousands of times, and it slowly dawns or sinks in. That feeling, feelings that we have, aren't what we imagine they are. There's another um, question that got sent in. Um, I have a question with working with unpleasant feeling tone. I was talking with a dear friend and we had an opposite view on something. When I got off the phone, I felt tense and that she didn't understand me. I felt so tight, I started to watching the breath. It took 20 to 30 minutes with the breath to calm down. Is it okay to use the breath that way? Because when I try to be mindful, I sank into the story. In fact, every other negative thing in my life started to come up too. I, it's really great that this person recognized that. I realized it wasn't me, just nature, but I still needed the breath to calm me down. Is it okay to use the breath that way? After I calmed down, I felt great love for my friend again. Yeah, of course, it's great to be able to, to have that breath, but in a way, you want to play the edge, use the breath, but maybe even use the breath in conjunction with some of the pain that got generated from that experience, breathing in and, you know, to whatever degree, maybe initially just be with the breath because this is your primary meditation object. The mind knows how to settle, how to let go of the world because it knows how to be just with the breath as you're coming in, as it's coming in and going out. But after a while, before maybe that reaction and the unpleasantness of that reaction goes away completely, maybe just see that it's still there as you're breathing in and breathing out. And when it gets to the right level of exposure, you might realize that the heart doesn't need to be afraid of whatever reaction arose. And that you might not even need the breath you might be able to just feel that storm without getting sucked into thought. The reason we sink into thought or spin away into thought is we don't trust that we can be with the unpleasantness of whatever that unpleasantness is from the, the conversation. So we think about it as a way of containing, like because we've personalized the unpleasantness, we feel like I have to personally contain this. It's going to kill me. But we actually haven't checked out, like, is it going to kill me? Is there anybody to kill anyway in the way that we imagine? So it's okay to go to the breath, but we don't want to immediately run from the practice of being in the middle of the river of feeling tone. But it is very useful to be able to use our meditation object to create enough space, enough stability, enough calm, 
so we can do the work of insight meditation. And this is generally how the Buddha taught. You know, we have these two um, basic strategies that really need to work together. There's the whole strategy of how to calm, stabilize the heart and mind. And there's all the strategies about seeing what we're not seeing, having insight. And so when we've gotten activated, then maybe we emphasize the tranquility and the stabilizing aspects of the practice, but we don't forget about the insight because if, if we overemphasize the stability, we miss opportunities to learn. And the learning usually happens along the edges where there's enough stability but we have it like so distanced the mind from exposure that there's nothing to learn because it's too distant. We're just in a nice place. And the mind in a way can indulge in that tranquility. Not that it's bad. It's not bad to rest in tranquility. It's just, we want to be as interested in uh, seeing like what we haven't seen about that painful feeling that got generated in the conversation. Is it what the mind imagines it is? Like unworkable, unsafe to be with? Because that implies that that feeling is personal, that yucky feeling, but is it? And there's only one place we can check that out when that unpleasant feeling is there. We can't check it out theoretically like thinking about it when it's not there. It has to be there to some degree for us to learn something about what it is and what it isn't. There needs to be some exposure. We need our lives. We need our messy, complicated lives to do the work of wisdom. Otherwise, you know, people will just rely on concentration because you get into a nice place and you have some distance from the pain of being a human being or anxiety of being a human being, but you always got to come back. You know, somebody's going to disturb your concentration or your knees will start to hurt or, you know, whatever else, but so it doesn't last forever. Well, there were a few more, but I didn't get a chance to get to them. Sorry for those who sent in questions. Really appreciate it being with you all these seven weeks. The next Buddhist studies class were continuing with the Buddha's primary discourse on mindfulness, what's called the Satipatthana Sutta. So in the winter, we did mindfulness of body. Here now in the spring, we just did mindfulness of feeling tone. The next of the four foundations is mindfulness of mind, the quality of mind. And then in the fall, we'll do mindfulness of dhammas, the awakening factors, the hindrances, and the process of awakening itself, being mindful of the process of awakening itself. So uh, that starts on the 28th of June. That means there's a break and part of that break time, we're gonna be doing the community practice intensive it will be June 7th through the 26th, three Mondays, and then a day long retreat on the 26th. We'll be doing it on Zoom Although we do expect that some things will start in sometime in June, perhaps even the 1st of June, we'll start simply and then just start building depending on the CDC and the Minnesota Department of Health and other, we have three wonderful doctors who have been advising us about how to reopen the center. So hopefully, but just to be honest, you know, with the new variants and the low vaccine rates, that seem to be gonna continue, um, it's, we're probably not going back to normal anytime soon, but we will start having public programs, in-person programs um, at some point. And just so folks know, there's a day long retreat this Saturday led by Jean Haley and Stacy McClendon, 9.30 to four, feel free to sign up for that. Um, and another thing you might be interested in this Tuesday at 7.30, Shaila Catherine, a wonderful Dharma teacher is gonna be talking about concentration practice, 7.30 to nine this coming Tuesday. It's right after the truth and justice vigil that a number of well-known black Dharma teachers are leading for Calm Ground and for the wider US community. Everyone's welcome 
just holding space for the activation of what we're all probably feeling in different ways with the trial of uh, Eric Chauvin and the police officer involved in the killing of George Floyd and all the other um, terrible things that are moving in our local community here with the more recent killing of last week. So really great to be with everyone. Wishing you well, learning about Feeling Town and hope to see you down the road. Take care, everybody.